feet and daylight unto my path. Welcome to Searchlight, a survey through Scripture with Pastor John Corson. It is our desire to bring you a systematic study of the entire Bible, chapter by chapter, book by book. You may wonder, how do we know that we are in the last days? One way is by our Lord's statement that the last days would be as in the days of Noah. In our current verse-by-verse study of Genesis chapter 6, Pastor John is comparing our present time with that of Noah's day. The parallels are amazing and show us that we are indeed in the last days. Our program today is the second part of this teaching, which is being aired over four broadcast days. Let's join John now as he is talking about what it was like in Noah's day. Now, in Genesis chapter 5, if we say a generation is 40 years, if we use that figure just for discussion, you have at least 40 generations in Genesis chapter 5. And the real kicker, the real factor in this demographic discussion is this. They lived a long time. So the population would be, conservatively, billions and billions and billions served daily. (laughs) Just billions of people. I mean, we are talking about a world that was more crowded, perhaps, more densely populated, possibly, than our world is presently. There would be a huge population a population explosion that is suggested in verse 1. The world was becoming populated big time. Now, we're going through such a time in our own last days in which we live as well. For you that study these things, from the time of Noah, from the time when Noah got off the ark, he and his wife and three sons and their wives got off the ark, It took from the time of Noah until the year 1867, shortly after our Civil War, for the world to reach the one billion mark in population. That's a lot of years, gang. From the time of Noah. Why? Because of plagues, because of wars, because of health conditions and all kinds of Factors enter into the equation. Man died young and didn't live long, and there was plagues and wars and all sorts of problems. It took from the time of Noah to 1867 for the world's population to finally reach one billion. But it only took from 1867 to 1935, less than 100 years, for the world's population to reach Two billion. So all that time from Noah to 1867 to reach one billion, and then from 1867 to 1935 to reach the second billion mark. And from 1935, it only took 30 more years until 1965 to reach three billion. So the graph goes like this. Slow population growth, 1867... And then you go to 1935, 1965. Now we're at 3 billion. And from 1965, it only took 30 years from 1965 to 1995 to reach over 6 billion. It doubled in simply 30 years to 6 billion. And now... We are told that the population, as of now, will double every 15 years. The population is growing exponentially. 
6 billion. Now we're headed towards 7 billion. You can sense the population growing. In fact, there's an additional 250,000 people added to the planet every 24 hours. After you take away the deaths, there's 250,000 people added to our planet every 24 hours. A quarter of a million every single day are added, and most move to the Rogue Valley. (laughs) At least it feels that way to me, I'll tell you. Trying to get through town now. I think they're all coming here, but be that as it may, the population is exploding. And those who are aware of such things say it's ominous when you consider that 15 million people last year alone starved to death in our world, lack of food. Now, we don't sense that in our country, in our culture. But much of the world lives in that very real dilemma of growing population and shrinking food supply. So what does this mean? Well, Sociologists, those that study society, have done some interesting work on what happens when the population explodes. And here's what they did. These sociologists took a group of rats. And they put these rats in tight living quarters to see what happens to rats. They put them in the same proportional density as people live in New York City. They wanted to see how the rat race really affects people. So they put these rats in the same density as people live in in New York City. And what happened in this study is astounding. Two things took place. First of all, in that packed condition, the rats, first thing that happened was when they bore their young, they neglected the baby rats. They wanted nothing to do with the babies. The mama rats had no concern for or care about the young baby rats. The mama rats went off and got careers or did whatever, but they had nothing to do with the young ones, you see. (laughs) They forsook their young. The crowded conditions caused the maternal instinct to be suppressed, depressed. And secondly, not only did mama rat forsake her young rat, but secondly, the rats started turning on each other and eating each other even though there was adequate food supply. There was not a need for cannibalization, but the population density caused the rats to turn on each other and devour one another. I mean, does that describe New York City or what? I mean, you can sense that. You can feel that in your own little experience when you feel crowded. You need your space. And when you don't have that, it starts to have an effect on you. Well, obviously, when the population grows, it sets off some interesting implications sociologically. And these guys that study those things say that explains a lot of why inner city life is the way that it is today. It's unhealthy. Makes sense to me. Because, you see, we're sinners. We're a bunch of rats. And you pack us close together, and you got just a whole bunch of sin condensed in one little spot. And there's going to be some problems without question. (laughs) So the population explodes. Even as we are living in a time, and you're aware of this, when the population is exploding. That's how it was in the days of Noah. It says here, Men began to multiply on the face of the earth. The second thing to note here in our text, even though everybody was saying, hey, things are going along quite nicely, yet there was a population explosion. And then now we get into some real issues of what was really happening. There was terrible sexual aberration. The second thing that was happening in the days of Noah At the same time, Jesus said, many were saying, everything's fine. And when those that heard Noah preaching were saying, oh, you've been drinking your bath water, old man. There's no problems. But the word of God says, look carefully. There was aberrant sexual behavior. Verse 2. 
The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of all which they chose. The result of that was grievous to the Lord. Verse 3 says, oh, I'm not going to always strive with men. Look what man is doing or allowing to be done. 120 years I will give mankind, but they're at the end. For you see, the results of this sons of God going in unto the daughters of men caused, in verse 4, giants to be born. The word there is Nephilim, which means literally fallen ones. And these giants, verse 4 goes on to say, came when the sons of God went into the daughters of men and the children were born unto them. These giants, Nephilim, were the mighty men of old, men of renown, the legendary figures that are still talked about in many, many, many cultures, the giants. Now, what's going on here, you say? Two possibilities. There are those good men, good Bible teachers that say, the sons of God are the descendants of Seth. We talked about, remember Seth in our study last time? He was one of the sons of Adam and Eve that was a godly son. And men in the time of Seth began to call upon the name of the Lord. They called themselves by the Lord's name. They identified themselves as believers in God. And there are those that say the sons of God speaks of the descendants of Seth. The daughters of men speak of the descendants of Cain. Remember Cain? He also was one of Adam and Eve's sons. And Cain, man... He was a murderer. And from his line, as we saw previously, came a whole civilization, a whole culture that was dysfunctional, bizarre, and ungodly. And you can pick up a tape on that if you want to explore that further. But my goodness, what a mess was Cain's family tree. So, some say, you have godly men, descendants of Seth, looking at the daughters from Cain's clan and saying, hey, that's where the good-looking gals are. And they chose them to be their wives. The godly guys marrying ungodly women, and that's what's being talked about here. That's possible. But you have a real problem, I believe, if you look at it contextually, and that is this. Why would that produce giants? I mean, today in our time, if a Christian marries a non-Christian, it's not a good idea. You're going to have problems. It's unscriptural. It's foolish. But the kids that you produce from that kind of a marriage are not going to be giants. You see, although your family might have problems... It's not going to manifest itself in this way that our text is talking about. And consequently, many people would say, no, it's got to be something other than that. And I believe strongly the Bible tells us what was really going on here. The phrase sons of God, where it talks about sons of God here in verse 2, is b'nai Elohim, b'nai Elohim, sons of God. Every time, with one exception, in the Old Testament where this phrase is used, B'nai Elohim, every single time where this phrase is used, it refers to angels. The one exception is in Daniel chapter 3, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are cast into the fiery furnace. You know the story, don't you? And there, as they're cast in the fiery furnace... Nebuchadnezzar looks in and says, how many men did we cast in there? Three, your nebbiness. Well, how is it then that I see four? And the fourth is like the Son of God, B'nai Elohim. Now we know it to be an appearance of the angel of the Lord, also known as Christ. In the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, you see, is a name for Christ. 
And if you read Daniel chapter 3 more carefully, and I don't have time right now to go there, but you can look it up later, you will see how the name angel comes into the discussion about that one who was in the fiery furnace with them. It was, I believe, the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Lord Jesus Christ is called the angel of the Lord. And indeed, that phrase is used angel in describing the person who was in the fire in Daniel chapter 3. You can look it up later. All that's to say is this. Every time B'nai Elohim is used, it deals with angels, except for Daniel chapter 3. And there, too, it's not talking about a normal person. It's talking about a supernatural appearance. The angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ, if you would. So what are you saying, John? I am suggesting that what's happening here in this aberrant sexual behavior taking place is angels were having intercourse with women, humans. Angels? Oh, wait, let me explain. When you talk about angels, you have to realize that Angels are divided into two groups. Exalted angels that are around the throne of the Lord, doing work for the Lord, and fallen angels who are called demons. Lucifer, of course, was an anointed cherub who led a rebellion against the Lord in heaven. And when Lucifer fell and became the devil... Revelation tells you and me that one-third of the angelic host went with him in his rebellion, and they became demons. And then what? Well, some of these demons evidently looked at women and had relations with women sexually. The result was Nephilim, fallen ones, Giants, legendary men, men of renown. And so we see in every culture, whether it's Greek mythology, Roman folklore, you always have in cultural stories people that are giants, like, let's say, Hercules, the result of of some kind of a divine and human sexual interaction. And the result is... Hercules or whatever culture you're talking about. And some people say, well, that means that you're putting too much credence in Greek mythology or or cultural folklore. But listen, mythology and folklore is perverted, wrong, untrue, but has its roots in true historical events in many cases. For example, every culture on the face of the earth Every culture, whether you're talking about the Tahitians in the South Seas or Greek mythology, every culture has the story of a flood. Why? Because a flood really happened. Now, their story is all messed up, and the facts are all confused, but the basis of it, that the world was once covered with water, is absolutely true. And so when you study these things, folklores and mythologies, Oftentimes, it's confused and misrepresented and twisted around, but there can be a truth underneath the whole deal, you see. And in this case, yes. Well, so you're basing your thing, John. You're basing your point of view about fallen angels, demons, having relations with human women on Greek mythology or folklores from other cultures? No. The scriptures, I believe, give the commentary. Turn with me to Jude chapter 6, if you would. Jude chapter 6. Not Jude chapter 6, Jude verse 6. You'll look all night for Jude chapter (laughs) 6. Talking about the very real danger of apostasy. That is, groups that once were serving the Lord, no longer walking with the Lord. One of the groups that Jude brings out to illustrate apostasy is this. Jude, verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate or their habitation, their principality, their place, 
but they left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Certain angels who did not keep in their place turned away from the Lord and left their place of dwelling. These demons, their fallen angels, are chained up. Well, who are they? Now turn to the left a little bit, and if you would go to the book of 1 Peter. And now we have a further identification of who these angels that are fallen, who are in chains, who they really are, and what they really did. Talking about Jesus after he died on the cross, it says this in 1 Peter 3, verse 19. By which also he, that is Jesus, went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Jesus dies on the cross. Before he is resurrected on Easter Sunday, while he is in the tomb, if you would, he is now, before he comes out from the tomb, he first goes to prison, the place where spirits are incarcerated unto the spirits in prison, verse 20, which sometime or at one time were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a-preparing. Certain spirits, demons, are in chains. Jude 6, 1 Peter three nineteen. They're in prison. They were put away. So terrible, diabolical, so dastardly was their doing that God said those demons are to be chained up and put away in the abuso, locked up. Not all demons are, but certain demons were disobedient in the days of Noah. Their deeds were so dark, diabolical, and dirty, they were put away in chains. Now, Jesus, we are told in 1 Peter, he goes and he preaches to those spirits. Wait a minute. Preached what to him? Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> inch by inch, anything's a cinch. Smile, God loves you. What, what did he preach to him? Preaching to him about salvation? No. Preaching to him about their need for repentance? Sorry, that's impossible. He went to the headquarters of hell, if you would, to proclaim their in the headquarters of hell where the worst of the demons were in chains because they were disobedient in Noah's day, these were the demons that had relations with women sexually, chained up. And Jesus went and preaches, and what he says to them, I believe, is there in the headquarters of hell, he makes that his platform to let the whole universe know that Satan and the worst of demons have no more grip on or authority over John Corson or you. We are absolutely free. Good news. Those demons have no more authority over us. This is great to remember in these days where unrighteousness prevails. It is like the days of Noah, but it doesn't have to affect us. We have been set free. On our program next time, we will continue with this teaching from Genesis chapter 6, comparing the time of Noah with today. Please join us then. If you would like to have this complete teaching, you may order one from our website at johncorson.com. You may also call us toll-free at 888-544-4858 and ask for the teaching from today's date. Again, that ordering number is 888-544-4858. You will also find on our website a variety of Pastor John's books, teaching packets, MP3 CDs, and other Bible study resources. Again, the address of the website is johncorson.com. Searchlight is a listener-supported ministry. We appreciate your prayers and support. May the Lord richly bless you.